today we're going to talk about uh, activism's role primarily in electoral escape, uh, oh, sorry, <laughs> landscape. <laughs> this was a Freudian slip. This was a Freudian slip. Uh, uh, escape uh, um, is from this uh, from this really critical situation where we are, uh, where we found ourselves uh, in this year, where so many elections are going to happen. But also, uh, when we started uh, uh, composing this uh, this panel and this indeed this whole summer university, we were thinking about the multifaceted um, uh, role of uh, and the landscape of activism in today's world and uh, how it uh, how activism has been changed uh, not just because of uh, technologies and uh, activism becoming also digital which is something that is uh, my field of research but also in these uh, times of, of uh, interlinked crisis and uh, political crisis but also ecological crisis and uh, different kinds of crisis so uh, uh, what we're, we we want to investigate? What are these critical points uh, which are um, which are challenging uh, activism and how grassroots uh, movements and uh, initiatives are being uh, formed? Um, what are the problems with activism? Why is uh, activism not working? Um, where does it work? Where doesn't it work? And so. <coughs> Uh, from all these different uh, kind of um, different angles, we want to look into this uh, environmental activism, political activism, and different uh, types of activisms. Uh, so uh, I would like to first welcome our uh, first speaker, who is Mentor Beka. He is coming uh, from Albania and from Alexander Moishiu uh, University in Duras. And uh, he's a senior lecturer in international politics and research methods um, uh, at this university. And he's the executive director of the um, Sami Frasheri Institute of Political Studies. Uh, mentor, uh, thank you very much for joining us here. And uh, the floor is yours. Actually, my voice is very high, but I'll still use this one. Uh, thank you very much for having me here. I'm really happy. It feels strange, but this is my first time in Hungary. <laughs> so, it <laughs> uh, Actually, some 500 years ago, another Albanian surrounded the city. He was the Grand Vizier of Ottoman Empire, Pargal uh, Ibrahim Pasha. Uh, but he failed miserably. <laughs> so I'm really happy I'm here in peace because I'm not that tough. And I know I am aware of the heroics of this, uh, of this city. Actually, uh, my presentation is not my specific field of study, uh, but I'll try to do my best. And this is not a kind of classical lecture, but uh, some uh, thought-provoking ideas of what's going on and what's going to happen in the future. Now, uh, the main hypo uh, hypothesis is that we are going through uh, a period of uh, huge communication transformation. The structures of how we communicate our messages, how we communicate our thoughts, how we communicate our ideas is changing profoundly because of the digital transformation. And this has given rise uh, to a shift from more logical, kind of logical, rational discourse in the public sphere to a more em emotion-based discourse and storytelling. And almost all our politics is based on storytelling and we'll see uh, how this works uh, when we uh, speak further. Uh, this, of course, that uh, changes the public narratives uh, which are much more different than used to be uh, in the past. And of course that this has uh, implication even for civic uh, enga enga engagement as well. Uh, we'll see how this uh, digital transformation has uh, empowered the populist movements and now we are speaking after the elections in, uh, for uh, European Parliament. We have seen 
that uh, the populist movements in Europe, but all over the world are not stopping any uh, anytime in the future. So it's r we have to discuss this uh, issue. And how this uh, shift from logical discourse to emotion-based storytelling has empowered uh, populist movements and has changed the public narratives. And how the civic uh, engagement, how uh, uh, the social movements have to adapt themselves with this new uh, reality. Now, these are the portraits of uh, our classical leadership. Uh, they are very, uh, very familiar faces, uh, classical looking. Uh, they transmit, uh, let's say, good emotions. And if you follow their ac political activities, their uh, narratives, you, you kind of feel uh, good in yourself. But when you go now, these are our current faces. <laughs> these are not <laughs> bad, necessarily bad-looking faces, but uh, there is a kind of transformation taking place. So it's not the same thing. Uh, we have Boris Johnson now, it's not in its peak. We have Millet, which won the elections in Argentina. Donald Trump, I'm afraid there is no way to stop him to win the elections in November. I don't see any path of victory for uh, Biden. And we have Modi in uh, India, who won the elections again this year. Now, political communication is based mostly on the portraits and very short messages. Uh, good-looking portraits, not good-looking portraits, but attractive portraits are very much important in politics today. And you see, after the election, European ele uh, elections, the most powerful political personality in Europe is Giorgia Meloni. No one expected this five or uh, six years ago, but actually she is the most powerful political personality in Europe, coming from nowhere. Now, why this happened? Uh, because we are going through uh, some uh, transformations, which are very much important. We have this decline of traditional media, the rise of new media. Uh, we have uh, what I uh, spoke before, this shift from logical to emotional-based storytelling, and as a byproduct, the empowerment of the populists. The data shows us that at the beginning of 90s, we had almost 60 million uh, papers in the U uh, newspapers in the U.S. circulating. Now we have gone to 24 million in 2020, and as I know, uh, the latest uh, data, it is almost 18 million. So it's going down every day. Uh, the same has happened even with uh, with the television, traditional uh, uh, television. And uh, this is this is uh, elaborated by uh, a U.S. author, Manuel Castells. Uh, I think he is originally from Spain. Uh, which uh, analyzes this shift from mass media to networked communication, which is a communication based on uh, the new uh, social networks, Facebook, TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, and so on. Uh, of course, that uh, this has brought uh, some uh, transformation, not just in communication structure, but even in the economic power of the media outlets. So it makes uh, this shift uh, very important and there is no way to go back as, as we see uh, things developing. Uh, 
we can notice an exponential gro uh, growth in uh, new media and social networks. Billions of uh, active users in Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and now TikTok as well. And uh, political leaders have to use this uh, powerful instrument and they are uh, bypassing traditional media and reaching the public directly through these uh, new instruments of communication. And of course, this transforms the way how they talk to the people, how they talk to the public, how they transmit their messages to the uh, general public. And uh, the, it is this uh, old idea that uh, technology is neutral and uh, the product of the technology depends on how we use the technology. But I think that technology has its own agency and the technology uh, transforms the way how we interact with each other and has a huge transformational cultural impact on the way how, uh, how we develop, uh, uh, how we conduct our activities, political activities, cultural activities, uh, social activities, and so on. Uh, the way how uh, the politicians, how politicians use uh, these new instruments uh, are uh, common, and uh, uh, I think they are f uh, familiar for you, so I don't have to, to, to stick to this uh, point. Uh, I'm not sure if this name is familiar to you, Mauro Calisse, he's an Italian political scientist. He has been uh, observing Italian politics for uh, almost 40 years and he has uh, three fundamental books uh, which analyze uh, the, the development of Italian political life. Uh, in the first book, which is called After Partitocrazia, Dopo la Partitocrazia, uh, he uh, analyzes how the Italian old system based on parties was destroyed after the 90s. And in the second book uh, of uh, Mauro Calisse, which is written in 2010, I guess, he uh, brings the idea of personal parties, how the politics moved from structure, from political party structure, to more and more towards uh, the strong leaders. And this corresponds with, uh, uh, corresponds with uh, uh, Cinque Stelle, with the rise of Cinque Stelle in, uh, in uh, Italy. The third book, which is, I think, fundamental, uh, brings the metaphor of uh, Machiavelli, the prince. And it is called Digital Prince the digital prince. Uh, in this uh, book, Mauro Calisse talks about uh, the new kind of leader, which is based in digital communication, and how this new prince has to use all the instruments at his disposal to communicate uh, his ideas, to communicate directly with the people uh, without being mediated by other structures. And this creates a different kind of uh, political leader. And we see this kind of political leader uh, if we speak about uh, Giorgia Meloni. And it is very much similar, I think, in many countries, even in my country, in Albania. We have a kind of digital... Uh, we had a digital citizen with the leader of opposition, now we have the digital prince with our uh, prime minister who uses very well all uh, the instruments at his disposal to communicate directly with the people. And the politics has been centralized uh, towards these uh, strong personalities uh, which, uh, which have transformed the political scene, I think, across, across Europe. And 
I think that, that this kind of transformation that has been taking place for a long time, uh, I'm not saying that emotional storytelling has not been part of politics. It, of course, it has been part of politics uh, all the time, during all the time. But with the new media, with the new uh, digital realities, this kind of communication is unmediated. A uh, politician can reach the people directly and can communicate their emotions, their uh, uh, personal stories directly to the people and creating uh, some uh, situations that it was almost impossible to have it before, uh, before this uh, uh, communication transformation that happened with the rise of digital media. Of course, that uh, the new realities require uh, a new way of engaging for uh, social uh, social movements for people that uh, are conducting civic uh, activities, because uh, there are opportunities and limits as well in uh, in this new uh, uh, digital reality. It is easier for people to engage, it is easier for people to communicate, uh, it is cheaper uh, to communicate with people using Facebook, using Instagram, using TikTok, Twitter, and so on. So uh, the barriers to enter civic engagement, to enter civic sphere, it are much lower now with the, uh, uh, with the rise of digital, uh, digital uh, forms of communication. And of course, the reach is much uh, broader. You can uh, reach more people, you can create networks, you can engage networks of people uh, in the public life. Uh, and the visibility is much more uh, higher. Uh, there is a story of, uh, of a politician in Albania. He goes uh, in his village, of, in his birth village, uh, of, uh, in the village of origin, and uh, he, he he goes to a mountain, to a high mountain, and makes some pictures and videos and so on. And uh, many people were talking, and one of his advisors was, was talking to the people of the village and tells him that he does this because he wants a high reach. And he tells him that we don't know any reach here. There is no one who is named rich in our village. <laughs> so it's... Uh, People are doing everything to have this kind of reach, so to, to have a broader uh, reach uh, in their activities. And even the, even the social activists can, uh, can do this, and we'll see. Uh, there are a lot of uh, cases where uh, social uh, activists have uh, instrumentalized digital platforms to enhance their presence in the public uh, life. Uh, I think that uh, a Me Too movement, uh, Greta Thunberg, uh, and l uh, lastly, Bassem Yusuf. Uh, if you have followed the, the, the war between Israel and Gaza, and the public discussion surrounding uh, this war, uh, one of the most uh, significant figures emerging after the war is this guy, Bassem Youssef. Uh, after the interview with uh, Piers Morgan, which was uh, unexpected to have had such kind of impact uh, all, over the, all over the world, and he uses very well the sarcasma uh, to reach people, to engage people emotionally. And I think that this is a good uh, way how social activism can prosper in the future and can counter the rise of populism in, uh, in politics. Uh, one of the most successful, I think, uh, ways of using uh, digital uh, media 
in uh, social activities is uh, social movements surrounding uh, climate change. And uh, we've seen that even a kid like Greta Thunberg can become uh, someone very important, can become someone that uh, is uh, well respected and uh, her voice can be uh, listened everywhere. So uh, it doesn't matter the objectivity of what she is saying, but uh, her message is spread and has a global reach uh, around the world. Of course, there are challenges and limits uh, surrounding uh, social uh, activism uh, after this new age of uh, uh, digital transformation. Uh, one of the uh, one of the biggest problems, I think, is the digital divide because not all people have access to uh, ha have access. Uh, uh, on internet, have access on uh, digital media. Uh, therefore, this creates uh, inequalities even in uh, uh, social activism and disparities across, uh, across the world. And this is one of the biggest uh, challenges that we face when it comes to using uh, digital platforms for uh, social goals. Another thing is uh, superficial engagement, the so-called slacktivism. Actually, I think, uh, especially, especially in uh, developing countries, this is the biggest problem, and we can see this even uh, in my country, in Albania, where we can see a lot of uh, activism within the boxes, digital boxes, within the digital platforms. Uh, people are... Uh, screaming in Facebook, Instagram, in uh, TikTok, but when it comes to real engagement in real world, then we have, uh, we have a lot of problems. And uh, it's not the same as we can notice in, uh, in digital uh, media. This uh, slacktivism actually is, I think, the biggest problem uh, in using, uh, in using uh, digital platforms for, uh, for reaching, uh, for, uh, uh, okay, I, I'll try. I speak slowly, so <laughs> I'll try to, I'll try to uh, summarize it. Uh, of course, there are even uh, uh, other uh, impediments uh, to social activism related with the uh, digital platforms, as you can uh, see them. Uh, I think that social activists have something to learn from populists. Even social activists have to use uh, emotion-based narratives to reach people. Uh, if populists are fear-mongering and they base, let's say, their political activity on fear, uh, social activists can be emphatic, can, uh, can uh, uh, use positive emotions to create, uh, let's say, social movements. And w we can uh, think a lot, I think, from uh, Charles Taylor's ideas that we cannot escape emotions. They are present. We have to use them in a positive way to create communities and to engage people in communities. And I think that in our days, the only way to deal with such transformations is grassroots activity, where people relate emotionally to each other and can contribute uh, in a positive way uh, to, uh, uh, to limit the damages that can be done by populists and to create positive social uh, movements and positive uh, uh, social relations in, uh, in their communities. So with this, I'll uh, end my, uh, my short presentation because even the time was very short but, uh, and I have gone uh, a bit slowly, but we can discuss later in the QA uh, session, I think. Thank you very much.
thank you so much. Uh, that that was very interesting to me also because I'm this is uh, my field of research as well. And I just wanted to mention the word algorithm, which you which you uh, uh, should probably wanted to, but there was no time. And uh, that just to mention this one uh, thing that uh, has come up in many conversations about social media and uh, activism. And that is that there is some kind of a monolithic narrative about the algorithms, uh, meaning that they are most likely to be radicalizing people and closing them in filter bubbles and promoting hate speech and are generally uh, perceived as overly negative. However, some research uh, showed that, uh, that they uh, also can uh, uh, intentionally or unintentionally uh, create uh, very interesting uh, outcomes. For example, uh, de-influencing and this environmental activism which you talked about, uh, peace activism, reconciliation activism, and uh, algorithms as sort of human, non-human, human machinic uh, actors uh, that are described as socio-technical. Um, then also, as you mentioned, uh, that technology has agency. That is very interesting to point out. But also uh, that these algorithmic um, uh, sort of activities are not really predictable. They can they can they can lead to both left wing and right wing activism. So um, they they can also have positive effects, which a lot of th this is very interesting to me because that was uh, something that I was researching. And uh, speaking of uh, possibilities to make a change through um, digital uh, activism, uh, something that is uh, very close to the Balkan region is the protests against lithium mining. And uh, generally environmental movements in the Balkans uh, that have been uh, uh, helped by social media and digital activism. But uh, I would like to now uh, invite uh, Aida Kapetanovic, who is, uh, unfortunately, she had an uh, injury and couldn't join us. Uh, Aida, thank you so much for being here, and I hope you're doing well. Um, I hope you're feeling better. <laughs> um, and uh, I would li like to give the floor to you. Uh, I had the privilege and, uh, to meet Aida uh, before, and uh, I'm really happy that she joined us, and we share similar uh, research interests uh, in environmental uh, activities in the uh, activism in the in the Balkans. So Aida, uh, welcome, and uh, I hope you can hear us, and I hope we can hear you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, do you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Thanks. Okay, great. Um, should I share my my presentation? Yes, you can certainly try. <laughs> okay. Let me see which one works. Um, can you all see? Yes, yes, it's perfect. Thank you. Okay. Okay, perfect. Well, uh, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Ivana, uh, for inviting me. And I'm so sorry I missed the opportunity to join you in person. But as you can see, unfortunately, I have a broken uh, hand. Um, and uh, also, I apologize if, uh, yeah, my, my presentation is a little bit improvised because I wanted to... Um, think of it uh, in order to frame it a little bit more in relation to this panel. Uh, but unfortunately, due to this injury, I didn't have a lot of time and energy to do so. But I see that already the first presentation can very well actually uh, be matched to mine. So uh, what I am presenting is uh, basically the overview of my uh, PhD research uh, work that is almost at its uh, final uh, phase. Um, that is uh, a research uh, on uh, the river guardians, so the struggles that emerged uh, in uh, defense of the rivers against uh, hundreds of projects of uh, small hydropower plants in Bosnia and Herzegovina and Serbia. Um, since at the beginning of the 2000s, um, the um, implementation of the European Green Deal 
uh, for the Western Balkans as part of the conditionality measures led to this uh, surge in investments, especially in hydropower. As you can see, this is a, a map of the region in uh, 2017, in which the dots represent the hydropower plants. The black ones are the ones already constructed and the uh, red ones are the ones planned. Uh, and the size uh, represents the size of the dams. So the bigger ones are the big classical dams. And then there's a big amount of uh, small uh, of projects of small hydropower plants that produce under 10 or under one megawatt uh, of um, electric energy. And uh, just to show you some of these uh, examples here, we have a focus on the two uh, countries that I uh, focused on, uh, Bosnia and Serbia, uh, that, are, as you can see, are very much dotted. And um, again, from these graphs, we can see that both in the Bosnian case, this one, the first one, and the Serbian one even more, uh, the majority, the overwhelming majority of the planned uh, hydropower plants were of this kind, um, so the small ones. Um, and uh, apart from producing a little amount of energy and being very small, so very quick to um, to be constructed, um, they uh, have also this system that is not the one of the classical dams, but of uh, channeling uh, the rivers into pipes directly from the riverbanks. So as you can see, uh, we don't have to be uh, experts to understand how uh, this looked very much intrusive uh, also for the people that were affected by these uh, uh, projects. Uh, so what happened was um, this emergence of uh, the opposition uh, by the affected communities, uh, especially in the peripheral rural areas, to these projects. Uh, but what uh, struck me and what uh, caught my interest uh, was that uh, these um, rural communities from the peripheral areas of the Balkans that are usually very much associated uh, to uh, conservatism, traditionalism, uh, and nationalism uh, actually managed to um, broaden their local struggles into a big uh, environmental movements uh, that uh, acquire the national scope uh, and the regional scope as well, uh, with the involvement also of uh, environmental activists, NGOs and experts. And um, what interests me, uh, coming from uh, a sociological and social movements perspective, is uh, mainly the um, uh, cultural aspects of uh, collective action. Um, so what I explore are the narratives that fostered mobilizations in the peripheral rural areas um, and how uh, collective identities can be activated and transformed in these uh, locally rooted environmental struggles. Um, to go very quickly through uh, this part, I just... Um, share my theoretical framework that um, applied all those debates uh, in uh, environmental sociology that uh, um, relate uh, environmentalism and environmental struggle to broader social and political issues. So go beyond and challenge this idea of environmentalism uh, as being a post-materialist uh, issue. Um, and also um, all those uh, debates that look at uh, local struggles that carry global uh, issues and concerns and that are globally interconnected with an attention to uh, how the attachment to place and uh, identity um, can play a role in mobilizing in environmental conflicts. And the main reason was uh, basically to go beyond some of the dominant um, frameworks that are usually used to explore and understand activism and environmental issues, uh, not only in the Balkan area, but in the broader post-socialist uh, Eastern European context, where there was for long years uh, very much a focus on the whole transition process, on the NGOization of activism um, and of environmentalism, uh, and on the effects of uh, uh, Europeanization in the region on environmental governance. So with the willingness to put the region back again in its uh, global interconnections, uh, not only in terms of uh, empirical uh, aspects, but also in terms of uh, um, what uh, 
the region can uh, um, produce in terms of uh, debates. And so how can it contribute uh, in broader and global debates? Uh, and uh, I use, in terms of methodology, a frame analysis, which I think uh, can is a very useful um, methodological tool very much used in the social movement studies, uh, especially in this area, in, in this era of uh, a lot of uh, digital activism or attention to the dig digital aspects of, uh, of social mobilization. So I find this uh, method um, in interesting and uh, useful for me, uh, in which frames are defined as uh, interpretative schemes that are used to uh, basically um, understand the reality uh, and uh, uh, define issues at stake and foster mobilization. And it is a very much uh, agency-oriented approach uh, and looks at framing as a processual dynamic and relational activity rather than frames as uh, uh, finished cultural products. Um, the data that I used uh, to analyze were both the online data, so what uh, the movements produced and published online, uh, especially on the Facebook platforms, because for um, both cases, uh, the Coalition for the Protection of the Rivers in Bosnia and Herzegovina and uh, Defend the Rivers of Stara Planina in uh, Serbia, uh, Facebook was the main uh, platform not only to construct the narratives of the movements, but also actually to organize and foster mobilization to the broader public. But I also used uh, semi-structured interviews that I collected during my uh, fieldwork activity in the two uh, countries and in the villages uh, where these struggles uh, emerged. And I also adopted uh, an as much as possible an ethnographic approach, although mine is not a proper ethnography, that enables me to uh, do this uh, slow comparative uh, analysis between the two cases. That means I do not look for um, uh, big generalizable uh, variables uh, that define uh, specific differences and or similarities between the two cases, but rather more nuanced and contextual specific similarities or differences. So the cases, uh, as I mentioned, uh, are the Coalition for the Protection of the Rivers uh, of Bosnia and Herzegovina um, that uh, developed in a specific uh, political context that we all uh, know that is uh, defined by this uh, uh, the Dayton system, uh, the Dayton power sharing system, uh, and. Uh, the Defend the Rivers of Tara Planina in Serbia that uh, has a different uh, political uh, milieu in which the uh, movement uh, developed. Uh, they also had different uh, trajectories and uh, territorial scope uh, and um, different approaches to the engagement in institutional politics, while in Bosnia the movement uh, avoided uh, to directly engage in party politics. In, um, in Serbia we have some of the leading members of uh, the movement that are now in the parliamentary uh, opposition. Um, and the movements uh, used and share um, different, uh, a different amount uh, of uh, action repertoires uh, that um, went from a range of uh, more institutionalized forms of uh, action uh, to more contentious uh, action, which were probably the ones that also foster these uh, um, um, emotional uh, shocks and moral shocks uh, that uh, then um, enable to broaden the mobilizations uh, in uh, in both countries. Uh, here we have some of the pictures. Uh, you might have heard about the brave woman of Krušica that defended in, together with the brave man of the village um, for 500 days uh, the, their river uh, with a blockade. Um, and then other example across uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina. And uh, in Serbia as well, there were mass demonstrations, but also a blockade uh, in Toplido or uh, the destruction of the pipes of a hydropower plants in Rakita. Uh, but getting to what are my, um, my research questions, so uh, the focus of uh, my analysis and my findings is, uh, so what are the frames that um, foster this uh, kind of uh, mobilization and enabled it to develop in this way? Uh, one of the 
main aspects that uh, defined uh, the um, diagnosis. So how the movements uh, framed the, the problem and the issue at stake was uh, what I call a sort of uh, uh, vital politics. Uh, that is that the uh, hydropower plants represented a threat to life. And life was interpreted in its uh, multiple and interconnected meanings that meant not only the bare survival of the rural communities that were rely on the access uh, to water uh, on the, uh, thanks to the rivers, but also their symbolic um, reproduction uh, and their uh, thinking and definition of time and the uh, connection between different generations. But in this whole understanding and framing of life that is threatened and therefore needs to be defended, um, also the non-human part is... Um, is included. So uh, this uh, threat to life meant uh, a threat to the relations between uh, different species, uh, multi-species in their interdependency that is mediated by those rivers that enabled to uh, broaden uh, these local struggles that could have remained of a NIMBY type uh, to broader environmental struggles uh, that uh, foster the mobilization also of uh, uh, environmentalists and NGOs and experts, as I said before. Unfortunately, I cannot read to you all these uh, quotes that I put because um, there is a lack of time. Um, but uh, there is also a more uh, explicitly political part of the diagnosis that I found that is slightly different among the different uh, movements due to the resonance in the political context. So in Bosnia and Herzegovina, the critique to uh, these projects of small hydropower plants enabled to um, develop uh, and frame a broader critique to uh, two interconnected processes um, and characteristics of the Bosnian political landscapes. Uh, one is uh, the process of post-war privatizations that were led by the elites uh, since the end of the war that um, um, tackled various uh, public assets and common goods and that are now um, trying to commodify uh, natural resources. And Connected to this, uh, the critique that is already um, has emerged uh, many times uh, throughout, uh, especially in the last years, uh, by social movements in Bosnia and Herzegovina, a critique to the uh, corrupt and clientelistic system that was um, enabled by the Dayton system power sharing. So these two uh, aspects, privatizations and clientelism, was the more political aspect of the uh, framing of the diagnosis in Bosnia and Herzegovina. While in Serbia, uh, what um, what emerged as uh, the problem in political terms was uh, a democratic deficit in terms of uh, exclusion, deliberate exclusion of uh, the local communities from the decision-making processes in uh, planning those hydropower plants. Um, and connected to this, um, a broader uh, and more historical process of deliberate uh, and top-down uh, strategies of rural depopulation aimed at uh, uh, or perceived as aimed uh, to marginalize uh, the rural uh, inhabitants and uh, to create uh, desertified areas in which uh, extractivism could have been possible without having any, any obstacles and any opposition. Um, and then in terms of uh, motivations, so how uh, the movements uh, um, framed a rationale uh, for taking action uh, against uh, these hydropower projects um, is uh, the um, attachment of uh, the locals uh, to the rivers. So what I define in my dissertation as the emotional politics of the um, of the movements that I think really much uh, connects also to the uh, previous presentation. So actually, they did use uh, personal stories and positive emotions uh, to foster mobilization, also childhood memories and the legacies uh, that uh, these uh, these stories and memories uh, create in uh, in at the local level. Uh, but they were able to uh, share them 
through also the different uh, the use of the different platforms and to create a sort of shared emotional attachment to those rivers that connected different uh, rivering communities that were experiencing uh, the same issue, so they attacked to their rivers, and also to include all those activists that, uh, through the struggles, uh, created and were um, included in this uh, emotional attachment to the rivers, uh, even though they never, uh, they were not born there and they uh, did not experience it uh, firsthand. Uh, and this enabled the, the whole uh, framing and therefore also the mobilizations to go beyond the local, but also beyond the national level. Um, and in, um, in my reflections, it uh, enables us to think uh, of uh, a sense of place, a new way of thinking the sense of place and the belonging to place that is at the same time uh, local and very much locally rooted, but it is shared at a global or broader level. If I manage, I would like to read to you just this, um, this quote uh, that says uh, from an inhabitant and activist from Rakita. He says, I grew up next to that river. I did everything there, bathed, swam, fished, looked after livestock. What am I going to do looking at a dry riverbed? So I can't imagine that. It's like that for me. It's like that for the person in Bosnia. It's like that everywhere. And that tied us together. I think this is a very uh, powerful uh, way of depicting this idea of an experience that is very much locally rooted, but it's at the same time shared by all those that have uh, their rivers attacked and are defending their rivers. Uh, Aida, um, and can, I, can I ask you to, to wrap up, please? Because uh, Yes, yes, yes. Them. Thank this you. Is so this is the, the final part in which I uh, see uh, how the based on this attachment to the rivers, uh, both movements were able to create uh, collective identities to foster the development of uh, collective identities that uh, in Bosnia were able to go beyond the uh, ethnic based uh, identifications. So. Um, through this threat to the rivers, actually the, uh, an identity based on the relationship with the river was reaffirmed and went beyond, uh, beyond the um, ethnic-based uh, divisions. While uh, in Serbia, we have a form of uh, uh, what has been defined by the activists of ecological patriotism. So a sense of attachment and patriotism related to the place and to the local, but that is thought of within an environmentalist framework. So it is not exclusivist uh, or nationalist, but actually uh, opened uh, and thought of as in coexistence between different people, cultures, as the quote uh, says. So to conclude, um, these different aspects shaped the, uh, the framing of the movements and enabled it to uh, broaden from uh, very localized types um, of, uh, of struggles to broader environmental uh, movements that uh, enable to uh, think of this affective or relational thinking of place that, uh, again, uh, highlights the geographical uniqueness of uh, uh, the places that are attacked and defended uh, that co can coexist within uh, global interconnectedness. So these are uh, my my conclusions um, and I just leave you with some of uh, the questions also that my research of course uh, opens and fosters for future debate. Thank you very much. Thank you Aida. I hope, I hope you can hear the applause. Thank you so much. This, this really fascinating research. Um, just wanted to say that uh, this discussion about how um, how activism can be both right and wing, and how it uh, how this issue, these environmental issues, go beyond uh, uh, beyond n uh, nationalism, beyond uh, uh, beyond borders across borders. The, this is very interesting, and uh, my my research about uh, lithium activism 
similarly concludes that, uh, that uh, really environmental issues are transnational issues and where these identities, um, national identities and identity politics seems meaningless really when you think about these issues and uh, how you uh, showed us these wonderful uh, narratives, for example, these messages, water is life, voda je život. It's, uh, uh, it's really a question that is that goes beyond all the political, <laughs> all the all the divisions. So uh, thank you so much for your for your uh, for your presentation and uh, good luck with with both uh, your injury uh, healing and uh, also with your research. And uh, please stay with us for the Q and A session. And now I would like to give the floor to Dimitar Nikolovsky, who is uh, associate fellow here at uh, IASC, but he is also the director of EuroThink. Uh, Dimitar, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ivana. Uh, great being back in Kursak after a few years. I'm very happy to see many familiar faces. Um, so my presentation is going to be about uh, one of these uh, elections that you mentioned in your introductory uh, remarks um, and this uh, overall shift towards, uh, towards the right. So as some of you may know, we had elections in North Macedonia uh, two months ago and there, was a, there is a governmental change uh, from uh, the Social Democrats who were a very much left liberal pro-European party. Uh, we have now a switch to for the conservative uh, Vemero de Pomane. Uh, we in a, I would say a sweeping victory, uh, the now incumbent government won um, 58 out of 120 seats in the parliament. Uh, which is not a historically high victory for them because they have done better even before, but uh, the Social Democrats lost uh, catastrophically, uh, winning only 19 seats out of uh, 120, which is a historic low for uh, this political option. And uh, the reactions uh, to, this, uh, to this change is, is that there might be a change in direction of the country from a pro-European to perhaps more Eurosceptic uh, uh, approach. And uh, how to connect this with, uh, with uh, civil activism and civil society, I would say that one of the main reasons why this uh, change in uh, government and change in direction happened is that the Social Democrats who had uh, won uh, the sympathies of uh, civil society and of civil activists and this critical part of civil society, basically during their rule, uh, they lost uh, this, uh, this uh, support. Uh, now, in order to understand this, uh, I can uh, do a short genealogy of the events that took place in the last 10 years. Uh, first of all, between uh, 2006 and 2017, we had uh, the rule of uh, Vemero de Pomane, which is the, con the party that just came to power now. And in a very short manner, I can describe this, uh, this uh, rule as uh, right-wing nationalist uh, populist rule, uh, marked with uh, levels of high corruption. A uh, very controversial uh, Skopje 2014 project, which basically transformed uh, the whole um, look of the capital of the country uh, into this uh, Baroque neoclassical style um, that can be described something like Las Vegas or Disneyland, and it was uh, used basically as uh, former uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs was saying to show a middle finger to Greece and to appropriate uh, this uh, uh, disputed uh, uh, heritage uh, that we have uh, uh, with Greece. Uh, and of course uh, a very big wiretapping scandal uh, in 2015 when it was revealed that uh, over 25,000 people out of a country of uh, 2 million over 25,000 people were wiretapped. These were members of uh, the business sector, civil society, clergy, everyone who had been seen as some kind of a threat to the government. Uh, their communications had been uh, controlled illegally by the secret services. And these, of course, all of these uh, cases uh, and elements of the rule that I mentioned were producing uh, reaction on the side of uh, civil society. And for the first time, I would say there were mass movements in the country that were not determined by uh, nationalism or nationalistic uh, issues. Uh, for example, a uh, uh, very big movement against police brutality, against the rise of uh, the prices of uh, electricity and energy in general, uh, against the changing of the look of the, of the city, this uh, Skopje 2014 project, project, and then student protests. 
a, a, a protest camp in front of the government, and this all culminated in what was called the Colorful uh, Revolution of 2016, which basically brought down the, uh, the government. Um, and I have to um, mention again that this, all of these movements were a grand uh, coalition of various uh, smaller groups uh, in a very uh, cross-ethnic uh, mobilization. Of course, these movements, these anti-government movements, produced counter-movements on the other side. And uh, they were done with the heavy involvement of clientelistic networks and involvement of the uh, basically making people of the public sector to go out on the street and protest against uh, protesters with the purpose of increasing polarization and showing that there are basically these two kinds of uh, people in the country. One is this uh, treacherous uh, people, those who protest against the government, and the patriotic people, those who protest in, for, in favor of the government. But it was supposed to be masked as something uh, genuine uh, movement of uh, the uh, of this, that part uh, of the civil society, and that uh, not really that the uh, political party is mobilizing them. So you had uh, movements against the politicization of civil society, whatever politicization uh, may mean, uh, civil protection of Macedonia, protection of democracy. So you can see some of the reminiscent um, um, uh, movements and uh, protests that were happening also in Russia or how it is uh, being reacted when there are anti-governmental uh, protests. So under this a grand banner of colored uh, revolutions with heavy involvement, of course, of, of the best. And uh, this culminated, just like the uh, colorful revolution culminated uh, with the change of government, uh, these uh, other movements, counter-movements, uh, culminated in the storming of the parliament uh, in 2017 uh, under the auspices of the so-called anti-Tirana platform, uh, which was basically a mobilization on anti-Albanian uh, grounds. Um, and what we can talk about these uh, two sets of, uh, of uh, movements and uh, several ways, waves of mobilization is the, uh, something that me Mentor uh, mentioned in his, um, uh, in his presentation, uh, quoting Charles Taylor, about this authenticity of, uh, of, of the movement. And basically, what is the relation between political party and, uh, and uh, protest movements? And what is the main difference is uh, that whereas in this left liberal uh, part of civil society and this mobilization at the forefront were really genuine uh, grassroots uh, uh, movements and organizations and activists and then the political oppositional political parties followed after them uh, but didn't actually dominate uh, them uh, whereas uh, on the other hand this uh, right right wing movements were dominated and were run and controlled by uh, the political parties whereas there were many accusations on both hands about who is really authentic and who is the real uh, activist and real uh, citizen now the government changed in 2017 and this social democrats came uh, to power as i said uh, in a kind of a coalition with the civil society uh, and uh, it was a very pro-European uh, uh, government, very much ready to make concessions in, uh, in favor of uh, European integration. And perhaps one of these uh, elements why they, uh, they didn't do so well uh, at these uh, latest elections was that they were engaged in a rational uh, uh, discourse. Uh, meaning that they had to make uh, very difficult decisions, difficult uh, compromises, uh, and uh, it, was, it is, was very difficult to, to explain this uh, to the regular uh, citizens. So this is about uh, mostly about the relations with the neighbors, uh, Greece and, uh, and Bulgaria. And of course, um, a couple of vetoes happened to this uh, government. First, it was the long-standing veto by Greece for entering into NATO and the EU. And this was closed by uh, the PRESPA agreement where the name of the country was effectively changed to North Macedonia. Uh, and then afterwards, because this was very difficult to actually achieve some kind of consensus in the country, and it was expected that the country will start negotiations with the EU right after the change of the name, but then came a French veto in 2017, a very much cold shower, uh, under the excuse that they wanted to have a new methodology for enlargement, which I don't think really solved any uh, real issues, and I think it was just a repackaging of the old methodology. 
and then Bulgarian veto, which uh, um, under which uh, they asked for some kind of concessions in terms of history, identity, uh, and how history is being uh, taught. Now, the relations between civil society and the government in this time, a novelty in Macedonian politics happened, and this was the inclusion of civil society activists in the government, either in the um, uh, as MPs in the parliament or in ministerial positions or in lower ranking. Uh, position in the uh, in the public sector, and uh, there were here many uh, disappointments in the way these people behaved. Because one of the promises of civil society was that okay, we supported this government into coming into power and we helped you, but now we will be uh, this watchdog and we will do our watchdog function and control everything that uh, that you do, and we will call out on uh, everything uh, all the wrongdoing that uh, that uh, you 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 are doing. However, this uh, didn't uh, come to uh, to fruition, and there were some disappointments in the uh, from the people that uh, became part of the the structures. For example, one of the most notable um, uh, one of the most notable activists from before became an MP, and then there was a revealing uh, some some kind of uh, recording of him uh, uh, arranging a half of gram for cocaine, and he. Uh, no, he, 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 he resigned uh, uh, some time uh, afterwards. Uh, but also it happened about criticism, that uh, we saw an opening of some portals that were very much complacent with everything that was being done by, uh, by the government, and it was run by civil society people. Uh, so this uh, uh, expected critical overview, crit a critical approach to the government did, did not happen. They became just complacent in the everything that was uh, being done. And now in the research uh, that uh, we do at Eurothink since 2014, we've been measuring uh, uh, our public opinion. Uh, we saw this, uh, this shift. If there was ever a consensus on the pro-European path uh, of the country, we saw a change uh, in, in, the, uh, in the consensus and a uh, change uh, like this consensus was crumbling. So between 2021 and 2022, at the question, do you think that the uh, you, uh, membership in the European Union it would be a good thing, there was a drop of 20% in one year. So of, of traditionally, let's say around 70% consensus, this dropped below 50% uh, in one year. And this was uh, due to uh, the, this uh, uh, vetoes from, uh, from, uh, from the European uh, Union for starting negotiations. Uh, then at the questions whether you think the EU, the relationship between e, uh, the, the, the approach of the EU towards North Macedonia is fair, friendly and correct or unfair. Uh, in 2019, for example, 43% thought that the, the, the approach is uh, good and friendly and correct, uh, as opposed to 30% that uh, thought the opposite. Whereas uh, in one year later, in 2020, it was 60 versus 20. 60% uh, felt that the approach towards the country was unfair. So you can see that uh, this also re uh, uh, reflected in the popularity of the government uh, because um, everything that they did was done under the auspices of uh, European uh, integration. Uh, and they paid little attention to other uh, uh, policies. Uh, now, in terms of activism, as I said before, this promise of civil society was not uh, kept. Uh, so left, le left liberal part of civil society kept business as usual, quite, uh, uh, let's say, quiet. But then one moment broke, really broke um, this uh, support, and this was uh, the so-called French proposal when um, uh, the, the, the demands of uh, Bulgaria uh, were uh, met by the European Union and it was offered to North Macedonia to, to make some concessions, okay, but the main concession was in order to open negotiations and start opening chapters uh, and clusters uh, uh, that we need to include the Bulgarian uh, minority into the Macedonian constitution. And this was met by criticism by some uh, parts, pro-European parts of uh, civil society, and I would say that they lost the, the, the government lost the support uh, uh, from this. And of course that uh, other parts of civil society were involved in what is traditionally known in the Balkans as these clientelistic uh, uh, networks. Uh, on the other si uh, hand, the right wing did a lot better in terms of activism and in terms of uh, keeping the tension and uh, keeping the interest of the people. And this was, as opposed to the rational discourse, this was uh, uh, very much involved, uh, involving uh, emotional uh, discourse. So at the name change, there were huge protests against the name change. Um, during the referendum for the name change as well, there, were, there was a very serious mobilization uh, of, uh, 
of people. Then when this so-called French proposal came, we could see a very interesting um, uh, shift from some members of the colorful revolution to go to cross to the other side. And this was done mostly because of uh, nationalism. So we had a political party called Left that was part of the colorful revolution and then was against, ben, but, but this political party left, I mostly call them national Bolsheviks, so their repertoire mostly right-wing and they're very much pro-Russian. Uh, pro um, uh, so we could see that this, uh, uh, this, this, uh, this reaction towards concessions for the European Union um, uh, were very much uh, strong. Um, uh, stronger, uh, uh, stronger on the side of uh, of, uh, of the right wing, and and as a reaction to to this uh, um, to this popularity, uh, then uh, then oppositional party Vamaro and now uh, incumbent was giving promises that once they come to power, they will they will not use uh, the the word north, uh, they will renegotiate with uh, Bulgaria and with the European Union about the the uh, the framework, the integration framework, and there was a huge disappointment among among the former, um, uh, former supporters of uh, the Social Democrats because the EU didn't really help uh, uh, the country uh, in this regard. Uh, the corruption, there were many high cases of corruption and the behavior of the ethnic Albanian parties in the, uh, in the, uh, in the, in the government uh, was also, I would say, uh, not, not, not really pro-European and not really uh, accountable. Uh, now, uh, the situation is that these pro-European forces are in a knockdown and there is no enthusiasm for, uh, for, for, for doing anything. So there's a kind of a lethargy on the pro-European uh, side uh, uh, in the country. However, uh, the, the promises that uh, Vomero de Pomane had about usage of the North or renegotiating uh, with the Bulgaria and with the EU, um, they are seeing that now reality is hitting, that, this, that these promises were quite empty, that it's not very possible. And this disappointment on the more far-right side op opens a space for the Levitsa and for the far-right that they might have a more popularity uh, in the future. And uh, to go back now uh, to something that was mentioned, this environmental movement, and I will finish with this, uh, that uh, this hope for depolarization of society are, in fact, environmental movements in uh, North Macedonia. Uh, there were some huge protests against the building of um, uh, mines, of copper mines, in the south and southeast of the country. And we, you could see there that there were really various people from far right and far left uh, and uh, also um, uh, more... Uh, more moderate uh, parties and also unaligned movements uh, going uh, going together. So, if this is kept, there is a hope for depolarization in the country. Thanks. Thank you so much, Dimitar. And also, I can see that uh, in the Balkans, we we have in in very different uh, contexts this uh, uh, <laughs> unite uni people are united around uh, around these environmental issues from both the left and and the right. So these are the issues that are not polarized, not polarizing, non polarizing issues. Um, Thank you so much. And now, uh, last but certainly not the least, uh, our own also Igor Stipic, uh, who is an um, uh, associated fellow here at IASC. And he is uh, a PhD student at the University of Regensburg, Leibniz Institute for East and Southeastern European Studies in Germany. And uh, I would like to give the floor to you now. Thank you very much for joining us. It's really good to see you. This is the first time I see you in person this, this time. Yeah, yeah. So thank you. Thank you so much, Ivana, and thank you, Jody, really for having me here. I'm so glad to be back and very, very excited. I, I think it's been almost four years uh, that I haven't been here. And yeah, I always have a special place for Kusek in my heart. I was here living for five years, I think. So um, I, will I, I was thinking for a very long time how to jump into this conversation because the, the topic of my research has changed quite significantly uh, since the time that I arrived here for the first time, which was 2014. And now we are in 2024, so it has passed 20, oh, 10 years. Uh, and uh, so in 2014, as you know, we had, uh, first of all, Arab Spring, uh, which uh, kind of translated into the Balkan winter. Uh, there was like a most significant 
I, I would say, part of social movements in the Balkans since the end of the war. The uh, House of uh, Presidency was put on fire uh, and many other uh, important governmental buildings were destroyed during these times. It was a time where a lot of rage uh, was demonstrated uh, around Bosnia and Herzegovina. And me as a political science student uh, at the University in Prague uh, was very emotional about this. And I was hoping that my country would change somehow at the time. Uh, ten years after, <laughs> the situation is very different. Uh, I do not study political science anymore. Uh, now I believe that I'm an anthropologist. So I uh, changed quite significantly and uh, actually my perspective on what's happening in the country has changed as well. And I will talk a little bit about this civil uh, activism in the country and the state of the country uh, as it is at the moment. Because we also have elections uh, coming up, I think, in October of this year and I absolutely don't expect anything <laughs> to change, but it's my own perspective. I, uh, uh, if people disagree, this would be uh, really amazing to hear. And what we, what we actually notice uh, quite a bit, because 2014 was such like exciting times, uh, people were talking about multitudes, uh, people were talking about citizens, uh, and there was a lot of hope. Uh, uh, now uh, we see this scattered uh, smaller scale social movements that are basically uh, related to what uh, Aida uh, was speaking about, you know, struggle for life and very different social segments of the population are involved into this uh, struggle and I'm not part of the struggle itself uh, while I was back in 2000. And 14, and none of my friends is uh, struggling, I think, anymore. Uh, everyone has kind of uh, renounced on the struggle and there's a lot of fatigue. Which maybe is not so bad, because I think mentally uh, you're much uh, more prepared to actually deal with what's around you, I would say. Uh, so, um, basically, um, uh, what, uh, what happened uh, since my arrival in Kuseg, I started doing a PhD, uh, like in anthropology of education, anthropology uh, of the state, which basically meant that I did... Uh, kind of state ethnography within a particular high school in uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina, which was one of the few high schools uh, where like uh, students of different ethnic groups studied together. Uh, what was very interesting to me is that this was not an international project, but it was like uh, remnants of war that uh, it was one of the few cities that didn't uh, divide completely. It is uh, the town of Yaitse, uh, where in 2017 we had a situation in which in a technical high school, which is basically working class high school, we had a struggle against segregated education and we spoke about this quite a lot yesterday. So again, I was quite right emotional about this and this is why I decided to study um, the, the case. Uh, I went there in 2000 and. Uh, 22, uh, I think, to do my uh, field work, and the situation at the ground was uh, not uh, bad. I mean, as we know, in anthropologists know, there's like no black and white, it's all constant negotiations between different situations. So we would have a high school in which uh, Bosniak and Croat students kept studying together, which one of the few cases in the country. Uh, but still they were divided among the national group of subjects uh, where history figures predominantly, right? So they didn't study history together, but they lived together with a common space, which is very important, so had the, they had the opportunity to interact with each other. So I stayed there for six months, uh, but uh, two, uh, during two months I was actually unable to walk uh, dur due to the injury, uh, so uh, it was not uh, as good uh, ethnographic fieldwork as I wish it would have been. Uh, but I learned uh, something. So what I learned actually that the memory of the struggle, which uh, happened in 2017, was almost nowhere to be found uh, in school five years after. Uh, what I found very interesting that the professors that stayed at school didn't actually engage with uh, their uh, students uh, with the notions of the you know legacy of the struggle and the meaning of the struggle itself. I relate this uh, to the fact that the position at, at high school are most of all controlled by the political parties, which are the parties who are in power. And actually, as you know, like uh, it happens in every society, uh, you know what you are supposed to say and what you are not supposed to say, right? So especially in a very small uh, town of 10,000 uh, people. So uh, I was very uh, amazed that I was maybe the person who uh, knew much more about the struggle than the students uh, themselves. 
and um, basically uh, it was kind of a taboo topic, uh, this uh, idea of having a unified school, because there is so much <laughs> bad blood spilled uh, over the history, right? So it's a difficult talk topic to talk about for uh, us here, and especially uh, to young people uh, who are maybe from between 14 and 18 years of age. Um, so, um, basically, uh, we still had interactions, people really lived in completely, I would say, n somewhat normal uh, way. Uh, they, we didn't have these stories of conflict that we see in the parliaments and so on and so forth. We had stories of love, as it happens in every high school, right? So, it was a very interesting environment uh, to be in. And during my time, maybe to connect myself to what Aida was uh, speaking about, there was two struggles in the town. Uh, one of them, uh, two of the, both of them were related to the river of Pliva. That uh, it's a basically main river that goes through the town and that's the main, um, uh, let's say, touristic res uh, asset that the town has. Uh, and uh, the first one was the idea to build a m mini hydroelectric power plant, which was uh, rejected by the people. Some of the students from the past struggles joined uh, uh, in, uh, to in, in this struggle, and this was successful. The, the uh, second struggle was related to the idea of building a, a lithium uh, um, plant. I don't know, maybe not plant, but basically a lithium was found near the town of Jajce in the ethnicity uh, of uh, Republika Srpska uh, because Jajce is bordering with Republika Srpska itself and people were afraid that the, all these residues will go into the river, they will destroy the river, the tourism uh, will die and there will be no future. So people were actually talking about it around the town but very quietly. Uh, because it was also considered to be a thing somehow of the Serbs because it was happening in the Serbian entity and so on and so forth. Uh, but um, within the school, again, it was not really not a big topic of uh, discussion. Uh, the a professor I work with, uh, uh, which I have, I have to mention his name because uh, actually he was the person I, I was most in contact with, it was professor of politics, Zoran Ljubicic, who was uh, completely not connected to any political party and he was a local dis dissident uh, th whose life got affected by his life of dissidency in a very small town where political parties in power did everything to make his life terrible. Uh, but he was uh, the one who was actually speaking to students about these struggles, but students themselves didn't really have an idea what's happening, to be honest. Uh, it was a working class school, people didn't like the theory, people didn't like things that we like here, so right, uh, nobody really uh, cared about. What did these students care about? Going into the EU, right? So uh, I, I, I was working in uh, four classes and out of them I did a small survey. 90% of the people, their main desire in life was go to EU to find work. And they were actually not uh, pessimists. What I found very interesting, they were so uh, filled with energy, they really wanted to work. So it was like witnessing a creation of an EU working class within a particular high school in Bosnia and Herzegovina. The preferred country of destination uh, was Germany. Uh, after Germany, Austria, and then after uh, Austria, Slovenia, and Sweden. Um, uh, Hungary was not figuring, uh, <laughs> surprise. Uh, so uh, this was something that we could learn uh, from, uh, from the ground. Um, so uh, uh, basically, um, I, I would say that uh, in general, uh, um, people keep disengaging from politics. Uh, I think that it will be just a game of political parties uh, going on in these elections as well. Uh, there is generally a lot of fatigue. Uh, the fatigue, for in my personal case, is such that I will not write uh, about this uh, high school in my PhD dissertation. <laughs> I have renounced on writing on this because it's, uh, I, I feel like writing about ethnicity <laughs> will lead me towards psychiatric hospital <laughs> in the end. Uh, uh, but uh, I will write about Chile and I'm, uh, I, this is the second place where I did my anthropological research. Uh, I'm happy that I'm one of the few uh, Southeast Europeans that has the privilege of not having to study ethnicity, which is like predestined occupation for all of us, <laughs> uh, unlike uh, Western uh, scientists who come to study us as some kind of <laughs> indigenous, exciting uh, and exotic people of the Europe. <laughs> uh, which is, uh, but the same happens to others, me being a white uh, anthropologist in the South America is also right, <laughs> problematic. Uh, 
uh, to say the least. Uh, but uh, uh, to, to end it on a good note, um <laughs> I will be working in high school uh, starting uh, next year as a high school teacher. <laughs> so I will actually do what I like and what I find exciting in life. So not all is bad. Uh, we have good things <laughs> in, in the Balkans, but politics is not uh, one of them. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much, Igor, for this inspirational story and this uh, kind of um, made us think. You made us think. Thank you so much. And uh, so now I would like to open the floor to to, uh, to you, everyone here present in Bibo Room and also online. And uh, you are welcome to uh, make any questions, preferably questions or comments, not too long because we have about okay, I mean, it, not too long, but they they don't have to be super short either. <laughs> I'm looking at the I'm looking at the clock, and I'm like, great, we have until twelve. So, um, Janos Bogardi. Thank you very much. It was very interesting, and I like to be provocative. And provocative in a sense that uh, I came a bit late, but uh, I believe I captured the sense of the first contribution, which was very interesting on uh, platforms, uh, digital uh, mobilization, and so forth. And uh, my uh, is that towards the end of your presentation, you said that this emotional narrative, which is to counter populism, but every coin has two faces. Now, you looked at populism, uh, from the good side, in quotation marks, and if you uh, award for a minute uh, the same attribute to the populist, they can say that now it is a counterattack with uh, emotional narratives uh, to contain us. Uh, uh, I would say uh, the political fight is in a new arena uh, where everybody tries to, uh, to play the game. Uh, the question is uh, now, Rather, uh, do you expect uh, a powerful regulation of this media? This means that uh, uh, in, in the written media we had rules that what you haven't put in a newspaper. For the time being, we have a, a very wide uh, vest in, in the digital media. And uh, the question is whether you foresee that this will be regulated in a way uh, that the ruling majority sets the rules. Uh, preventing the other side uh, to be as proactive and as innovative as for the time being it may be possible, whether for the good or the worse. This is my first question. And the second question is, uh, I am a water resources engineer, so saving rivers is beautiful, but you know, when we have a meeting where someone is from the other part of not the continent and has a chance to talk to us, and this needs electrical e uh, electricity. I somehow uh, ask the questions, if we save all the rivers of the world, if we do not mine all the oil and all the gas from, uh, because there are also other people affected, how do we provide uh, climate neutral or climate friendly electricity? It is not only possible by windmills, water is, uh, there is not enough water uh, hydropower in the world, but it is the most effective and basically almost the less, the least uh, environmental uh, uh, damaging uh, form of electricity. Uh, the question is, uh, I mean, I put my opinion, we have to probably sacrifice some of the rivers uh, and to save some others. And in a way, I believe that uh, small hydro is beautiful, so small is beautiful, say some, but I believe that uh, uh, to really uh, sacrifice some big rivers where we gain a lot of hydropower is probably more environmental friendly than doing s a small hydro and damaging sites where tourism uh, brings more local income as uh, the electricity. But uh, I know that this is, this is not a decision, it's not a debate which you can say, this guy, this time myself is right, all others are wrong, because it's always contextual, where you can do it, where you have to do it, 
or where you have other options or you have the mix of options. But let's be honest, we need energy. We need energy also for a more human life and, and, and a more uh, uh, equalized life where access to, uh, to goods and, and knowledge is provided for more than for the time being. Thanks. Thank you so much, Janos. Uh, if you agree, all uh, panelists, I would like to collect maybe a few questions and then you just write down what you have in your notes. Okay, Lira? Yes, I want to thank the panelists for very interesting uh, presentations. Um, I'm curious to know if there is any online social mobilization in North Macedonia and uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina. Because um, online social media uh, can be sometimes alternative to uh, dominant media platforms which in our countries are most of the time controlled by social groups or uh, uh, political entities and captured. So I'm very, interesting, uh, very interested to know if there is any uh, online social mobilization around various uh, causes. Is there any digital divide or is any challenge when it comes to digital divide? Or is any risk that this uh, online social mobilization can turn into a sort of slacktivism, so a sort of lazy uh, mobilization? So these are my questions. Thank you. Thank you, Lira. Kati, and who else was here? <laughs> ah, you. OK. I also would like to connect with the di digitalization with this armchair activist because in my fields I realize that it's more and more on the social and educational fields, let's say in Hungary. And is it uh, cause less in-person activists or, or how is it connected? And the other thing is the emotional narratives. We do remember the most important activists like Rosa Parks or Judith Hyman or Ed Roberts, they used emotional narratives always but they were still activists, mostly for me. So I think the emotional part is also very, very important. And thank you so much. So my question is um, to Mr. Becca as well. Um, uh, do digital media um, have a gatekeeping role as traditional media had before? And in this case, do you think that uh, digital transformation and the new form of um, of political or digital activism can further undermine democracy. Okay, a lot of questions about digital <laughs> media. Uh, oh. Thank you all for your fascinating presentations. Now I would like to um, engage with Aida's talk because we also have um, a lot of river activism going on in Slovenia and some activists were also making a documentary movie, movie about how they were canoeing um, down Sava and that was pretty emotional even to watch because they went past my, my hometown and they didn't engage with locals who were, I don't know, climbing in that area. So um, rivers are fascinating, as Ivana said, like tran tr the transnational idea about activism because rivers don't care, they, they just flow, right? And I'm just interested if you can envision some kind of a wider regional activist initiative where it wasn't, wouldn't be about patriotism or we're not nationalists, but we are all Sava or something like that. Okay, thank you so much, Zala. Uh, ah, yes, we have questions in comments. Let me, I, I need to come closer. Uh, another digital question. <laughs> what do you expect um, digital media and AI's further impacts uh, on social activism and formation of cult technoculture will be? And f that's uh, one question. And is it effective to leverage the reputation of successful activist, uh, uh, activists for uh, new causes? Or is it more authentic but unexpected uh, people better for the cause? In Georgia, we had a case um, of the Namakwani, Nam Namakwani uh, hydroelectric dam where activists halted the project. This, uh, these people are now involved in other environmental campaigns. They are frequently targeted and their reputation and trust can decline over time. 
Um, do we have any more questions or should I uh, should we start uh, with answers? Okay. So, okay, mentor for you, <laughs> the tough job. Actually, very tough. It's very <laughs> it's a very complex issue. And uh, as I know, uh, we'll have a session about complexities or not. Yeah. So it's very complex and it's very difficult to answer. Uh, let's start with the easiest one. When it comes to the rivers, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, uh, we had uh, the same problem in Albania as well. Uh, it was uh, a long fight between uh, civil society and the governments, many governments, not only the last one, about building such uh, uh, hydropower stations. And uh, Albania is a unique country when it comes to the dependence on uh, hydropower. So almost 100% of uh, electricity is produced by uh, 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 hydropower stations. And uh, we, we lacked uh, electricity and we had to build a lot of uh, new power, uh, power uh, hydropower stations. And it, well, it was a clash between uh, civil society and uh, uh, governments. But finding this kind of balance, I think uh, you are right, we have, to, uh, uh, we have to analyze the cost and the opportunity. Uh, uh, so uh, in, uh, in this case, uh, finding the right balance is the best way possible. We have to be pragmatic and not uh, uh, dogmatic when it comes to such issues. And I think that uh, uh, we can protect the uh, environment because uh, hydropower is the most environmentally uh, form of producing uh, electricity, one of the most environmentally friendly forms of producing electricity. And uh, uh, I think that uh, finding the right balance is uh, the way uh, ahead. And uh, I think this, uh, these are my, my thoughts on, on this issue. When it comes to the most uh, complex and difficult, uh, about the uh, countering populism with the same uh, instruments as they operate. Uh, I'm almost certain that old ways of doing politics are almost dead. It's, uh, the change is inevitable. Even uh, a conservative like uh, Edmund Burke used to say that change is inevitable. You have to adapt to the change. So we have to adapt to the change. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, social activism uh, has a lot to learn from uh, uh, how uh, populists conduct uh, their uh, politics, how they conduct their behavior uh, in relation with the mobilization of the population. So uh, in uh, uh, I think that uh, uh, it is inevitable to, uh, to use emotionally based narratives even from the, uh, from the social movement's point of view. Uh, because uh, this is the only way to push forward the agenda. Uh, and uh, I think that we can counter it uh, by being more uh, empathic with uh, uh, with uh, communities and uh, to create more uh, positive uh, uh, ways of uh, relating with the people. And this is the way uh, forward, I think. Because uh, going back to a more uh, uh, elabor uh, more rational, logical elaboration in public uh, discourse, it's not it's not working. Uh, the media space, uh, it's transformed in that way that we, can, we cannot use it in that form anymore. We had this classical uh, principle in journalism that uh, uh, it's not important uh, who is saying, but what is saying, unless he is the Pope. Now all the people are the Popes. No, it's not, it's not possible to go back to that principle again. And uh, we have to base our... Uh, uh, our uh, public engagement uh, in uh, curating the portraits of the people that are doing uh, uh, social activities and uh, designing the messages that are uh, delivered uh, 
uh, in that way that they can uh, emotionally relate with uh, with the public. So it's I think this is the only way for I I don't have any recipe how <laughs> how this can be done, but uh, I think this is the way forward. Uh, Can this uh, digital transformation, as I uh, as I remember, was the question uh, undermine democracy? This was the question. Yeah. Yes. Or I misunderstood. Okay. Okay. Uh, now, one of the main characteristics, as we see, is that uh, uh, the traditional media has lost this kind of uh, gatekeeping and uh, intermediary role between uh, uh, public activists, uh, being uh, politicians or uh, other actors, and the general public, uh, because the role of the traditional media has been un uh, undermined. Now, I, I'm very skeptical if digital media can do this, because in the digital uh, uh, area, uh, everyone can be a journalist. So it's uh, very difficult to find a way how we can intermediate the messages between uh, public actors and the general uh, public. Of course, this creates a lot of uh, opportunities for misinformation, disinformation, uh, informational wars and so on and so on and this is a big uh, problem uh, for uh, democracy as well because it can empower uh, radical movements, uh, uh, radical personalities and so on and so on. So it's, uh, I think that we will have a very difficult time ahead. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. And I, I would like to ask Aida to uh, try to ad uh, address those comments and questions. Thank you, Aida. Yes, thank you very, thank you very much. They are very interesting uh, comments and questions. Uh, so as for the issue of uh, hydropower and how we can actually uh, find a compromise <laughs> between the need to uh, for a ecological transition and uh, the need to also protect the the environment. Um, definitely, I agree with the fact that uh, a balance is needed. What uh, emerged from the uh, these movements is precisely this: the engagement, the need to have the local populations and those that are directly affected to be engaged in the decision making processes and in the production of knowledge, so that it. Um, the way to find this balance is, at least from them, uh, through uh, cooperation and through uh, the de facto a democratic uh, implementation and uh, decision making. Whether in the in some cases it is better to protect the river or to uh, install a, a hydropower plant. Of course, uh, the movements as well agree. Uh, also, because uh, in Yugoslavia, in uh, socialist Yugoslavia, we had. Uh, many projects of big dams, um, so they also agree with the fact that uh, uh, small is not beautiful in the sense that actually those small hydropower plants uh, produce very little uh, electric energy and create uh, huge uh, damage. So, yeah, I think uh, one of the aspects is this, the other is uh, very much related to a more um, ontological perspective. Uh, most of the activists in the Balkans also in the case of the lithium mining are seeing themselves as a, a colony of the European Union, as a place where uh, some uh, peoples and uh, territories are defined as sacrifice zones. Uh, so until there is this uh, situation of, uh, of power in which uh, policies that are uh, decided in the European Union then uh, affect people that are outside and at the margins of it, uh, this is also this also creates uh, an issue of, uh, of democracy and uh, yeah, of participation uh, in the in the whole decision making. Um, 
Then uh, for the question, uh, well, uh, somebody mentioned yeah, the importance of the uh, emotional uh, aspects in uh, activism. And I think, I mean, in, in my case, in, in my studies and analysis, it is definitely the key. So um, also in a way, uh, as I said, to uh, go beyond some of the classical uh, ways or, of doing politics, both in uh, Serbia and in Bosnia, and of going beyond um, some of the typical narratives that are very much emotional, but yeah, populist, uh, nationalist, and right wing sense. Uh, um, regional activism uh, is uh, actually growing. Uh, the very uh, movement of, in defense of the rivers uh, has created a regional network and I also see this uh, with a lot of hope um, because um, yeah as, as it was mentioned the, the rivers definitely do, do not know any any borders and uh, affect uh, different uh, different countries um, and um, the activists are really working on this on uh, having regional cooperation, regional networks and diffusion of uh, narratives and practices in uh, different countries because they can work very well either in Bosnia, in Serbia or in Albania due to similarities in the political context and in the parties that are on power. Um, and um, and then uh, in terms of, uh, yeah, the... the um, question, uh, I don't know if it was directed to me, but he, yeah, uh, of uh, the leverage of um, leveraging the reputation of successful activists for new causes or more authentic but unexperienced people better. Um, well, I think um, here also uh, probably a cooperation of both is the uh, is the best solution. I think in, uh, um, especially in Serbia, um, there was a lot of uh, talking about this, a lot of reflection by the movements about this. Um, but the strength of the movement and of its leaders and also their possibility then to engage in party politics was precisely this, that they presented themselves and they were actually unexperienced activists, unexperienced politicians. Uh, they they frame and they, they leverage the fact that they come from the field, they come from the villages, and they get, they go in parliament with the dressed and dirty as like because they came from the from the field. Uh, this is very powerful, but of course it has its uh, backlashes because then those people need to build their experience within. Uh, classical institutional and party politics and they can uh, be attacked and targeted. Uh, so uh, also having um, cooperation with more experienced uh, both activists and people that engage in oppositional politics uh, can definitely help uh, those figures uh, to also build knowledge and skills and to somehow have a shield against these um, yes, this, uh, these targets and the difficulties of, uh, I mean, being in a, in some of the parliaments that we know in in the Balkans, I just want to mention one last thing that is not was not uh, directly addressed uh, to me, uh, but on the digital divide and slacktivism, I think this was also a very uh, interesting point for the case uh, for my cases. Um, there was a lot of discussion between, for example, the um, um, development of um, the movement in Serbia that it became as a very grassroots it. it it developed from a very grassroots movement that uh, connected different local communities and then broadened thanks to the Facebook page, uh, Defend the Rivers of Stara Planina. But many of the uh, initial activists criticized this process because they said, we are the real people. When we organized among uh, local communities, we were real people, grassroots people that started the struggles. When then the movement uh, became a broader movement, there was this aspect of uh, slacktivism. There was a lot of people engaging online in, with the page, with the Facebook uh, uh, posts and so on, but we did not see as many people in the streets of Belgrade, for example. So this is also an aspect that the activists think about. And I think this is also, we have to acknowledge this, that those people, even though they are not uh, professional activists, a typical liberal civic uh, NGO members, they really like have some knowledge production about those issues because they care about them.
Thank you so much, Aida, for this uh, important contribution. Uh, okay. Uh -huh. Just to go back to the regulating of uh, new media. Uh, I don't think it's possible to regulate institutionally uh, how the new uh, media can work because it's so much decentralized and it's very difficult to do it. But this doesn't mean that uh, the new media has created a more uh, democratized uh, public discourse. Because I, I still think that uh, power structures that uh, have the necessary uh, resources uh, can control even the narratives that are produced by, uh, by uh, new media and digital media. Because uh, um, actually who writes the rules is the one who matters. Uh, so uh, you can uh, have access to these instruments, but uh, the structures that have the necessary resources to control these instruments uh, still remain the most powerful, uh, most powerful structures. And uh, the we have seen even with the, uh, the Arab Spring and the other uh, developments that uh, actually the narratives are controlled and oriented uh, in accordance with the interest of the most powerful structures. Thank you. And now I'd, I'd like to give the floor to Dimitar. Thanks. Uh, okay, I'll take a couple of uh, the questions that were raised here. One about the counter-populist uh, strategies and about the usage of emotional discourse. Uh, a few years ago I wrote a paper about exactly this colorful revolution that I, where I call it progressive populism. And this is because I approach uh, populism in this uh, Laclauian formalist value neutral uh, way where I look at the equi equivalential chains uh, of uh, various grievances and this is exactly what was uh, achieved in that time and what, uh, what, was, uh, what basically brought down this uh, government in 2016 and, and 17. So various grievances such as uh, precarious workers, environmentalists, uh, um, activists for privacy uh, and uh, generally seeking for, for, for justice and it was very much emotionally uh, charged as well. Uh, regarding online um, mobilization and media, I don't see a lot in North Macedonia at the moment. Uh, maybe a little bit of environmental, um, uh, especially now to connect it to this uh, small hydro uh, power plants. Uh, on the rivers, but this is in a very, very limited, very little. Uh, what I see as the most interesting example is the far right and this uh, frustration of uh, selectivism uh, on their side that they do not ma m manage to mobilize a lot of people on the street, but they have huge uh, support online. And I think that the main reason for this is that most of their supporters live in Australia, the US and Germany. Igor, you want? Aha. Uh -huh. uh, okay, then I would like to just uh, come a little closer to the screen so that oh, I, I can see actually. So, Anelia, uh, thank you for this uh, recommendation. She shared uh, this network. So, anybody uh, who didn't pay attention just wanted to draw your attention to this. Uh, it, is, um, it is a possibility for networking with researchers and communities around the world looking specifically at the river city nexus. Um, yeah, so. You can check this link out. Um, okay, um, thank you very much. If uh, maybe somebody has a, la oh, Sean and Jody, <laughs> thank you. And who was? Benedek. Uh -huh. Benedek was first. Who was first? Oh. I'll try to be quick. Um, I just wanted to, I mean, thank you all. Igor, thank you for an update on your research because I <laughs> it was a new to me. Um, I wanted to talk about you know the digitalization of, of, of our you know social communications these days, and I don't want to underestimate the manipulation of market forces and the commodification of politics and politicians. I mean, it's just made to get clicks, okay? And I, I you know we had this discussion yesterday about facts and myths. I mean, facts. 
still matter. Even if you think we have to emotionalize messaging, um, both you know for good causes and bad causes, I really think we need to involve a psychologist in these discussions to find out why emotional storytelling um, reflects a lack of something in our, in our existences. Why do we need that emotionality and, f and instead of facts? Why is that more persuasive than facts? And I think it's really important that we also um, deal uh, in, in facts. Um, yeah, so I mean, when I look at this kind of projection of emotionality on all different kinds of communication messaging, I just find it very solipsistic. I mean, it's just kind of a, a, a circle. We, we talk about ourselves to ourselves and, and we can't really um, move forward. My question is um, then, uh, why doesn't the mainstream media cover all of what is happening out there in terms of, uh, you know, grassroots movements and civil society. Civil society is one of the topics that I, I, you know, I research, and especially global civil society, and there is so much out there. And it, it is sometimes depressing, and I think it depresses people to think that nothing is happening. But we simply are not told about all of the initiatives that are taking place, like AIDA, thank you so much, um, absolutely. I think it's moving from the local to the global, which is called you know, global in our terms, and I think that that is one of the solutions to move forward, and there is so much out there. So I don't think that we should be too um, you know, depressed or give up on, on these larger issues when we can start solving them at the local levels. Thank you, Jody. This was a proper contribution. Thank you so much. And Benedek, sorry for waiting. <laughs> Thank you very much for the discussion. It was very interesting. So I have two questions. Uh, I work as a political communication professional. Uh, and uh, one of the things that I see is that we already democratized the access for the communication of streams. Uh, but it only created a cacophony and uh, polarization uh, within the political communication sphere. I don't really see how can activists uh, use positive uh, emotions to cut through uh, next to, to aggressive or negative emotions uh, because I think and I see that uh, the, the emotions which are play on security uh, are always more um, efficient to, to manipulate the, the, the mass. Uh, so if you have some kind of an insight, which kind of strategies or uh, approaches can be used to, to implement positive images uh, which can somehow play on the feeling of security, I think that would be a, uh, an interesting uh, um, answer. Uh, and the other thing is that um, if I think about populist uh, movements, uh, almost all kinds of political movements tends to be uh, to, to go populist because that uh, influences the biggest majority within the society. Um, and uh, sacrifices uh, the biggest uh, possibility to influence uh, to influence decisions within a political system. Uh, is it a bad thing to 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 use uh, populist agendas? And if you are sticking to this digital uh, context, aren't we limiting people to a spectacular position uh, where they, if you are going with Lacanian sense? They don't realize the subjugation of their social position. They don't uh, form into a, a chain of equivalence, and they don't seize the action. They are, um, I don't know, they are maybe just tolerate this position of the spectacular, uh, spect the spectacular position within the society. So, what is the what is the the possibility to translate the action uh, and to to realize that we need to take action if you are sticking to this digital uh, infrastructure? system. Thank you. Thank you. Another very interesting contribution to the discussion. Now, Sean, you wouldn't... Um, okay. Oh, okay. Oh, Petra. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you all for your uh, contribution. I would just like to wear, uh, raise awareness uh, for in the case of Bosnia about one social uh, movement that started online, you were, the lady was asking about it before, it's actually an initiative, Yermesetice, because it concerns me and I think it started around 2013 when uh, 
people in Priedor, which is a, a small city in Republika Srpska, were actually denied to have the possibility to commemorate the people who were killed during the Bosnian War. The genocide there was never accepted or uh, was never yeah, from the ICTY. And this initiative actually started online. It started spreading on Facebook. And now, 10 years later, this initiative actually grew out to be like a global movement where uh, people are now uh, commemorating the 31st of May, which is a white armband day, uh, remembering the people who were killed in the genocide and remembering of all the victims during the Bosnian war. And I think it has nothing to do with environment, but I think it's an important social movement that started in Bosnia in that time. Thank you. Thank you so much for mentioning this, Petra, because actually we wanted to have uh, this topic covered as well, and unfortunately we couldn't get anyone. Uh, it, we had some uh, cancellations, and uh, we couldn't get the, spe uh, the speakers who were supposed to cover exactly the topic of this uh, activism, reconciliation, uh, activism in uh, in Yugoslavia, especially about uh, Srebrenica genocide, and also um, uh, this war in Belgrade with graffiti for Radko Mladic and against, uh, <laughs> uh, and then repainting the graffiti. So that unfortunately we didn't have the, this story today, but um, hopefully next time. Uh, I think we run out run out of time, if I'm not mistaken, uh, un unless uh, you have. Um, we have a few minutes if somebody has something absolutely necessary. <laughs> um, uh -huh, okay, okay. Of course, when we speak about emotional narratives, we are not speaking about lies. So <laughs> we are not. Uh, it's not. Tell, uh, it's not that we have to tell lies. Uh, facts, uh, of course, that matters. But even facts are constructions, and they are constructed within a certain narrative. Uh, if you follow, for example, CNN or Fox News, they are talking about the same facts, but uh, we listen completely, we hear completely different things. So uh, even facts are switched on and off and uh, twisted in accordance with, with, with the narratives. Uh, of course, that the facts, uh, this is a very <laughs> long debate, so I'm not going uh, uh, into it. Uh, I think that we are in this uh, situation because of the of the failure of liberalism in many ways, uh, but it's a different topic and uh, we don't have time to elaborate on it. Uh, but I really think that it is very much related with this. Uh, when it comes to the positive uh, narrative, uh, positive positively charged uh, narratives, uh, I think that we have a lot of uh, cases. Uh, for example, uh, if we see this uh, Me Too movement, uh, all people talking uh, uh, are trying to transmit uh, positively charged narratives. So, uh, of course, fear is something that uh, instrumentalizes uh, 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 much easier the feelings of the people, but uh, we can uh, still uh, try to use uh, uh, positive narratives uh, to relate and to attach with the people. Just very shortly about this uh, issue of populism. For me, populism is not something scary or bad buzzword. As I said, I, I, I approach it in a value-neutral value way. Uh, but I think that this moment, uh, at, at least when, when there are electoral political campaigns, I think there are m a lot more elements of populism because you need to get you know, broader support from uh, all, se uh, all uh, segments of uh, society. Uh, on the other hand, in terms of social movements, I think that some social movements are actually using some kind of language of particularism that is not populist uh, per se. And this is what I was talking about, this shift from uh, movements that were only about police brutality, only about about uh, price changes and about rejecting uh, uh, people from uh, political parties to join and to, 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 to support them, so being scared of uh, you know, grander coalitions and then this shift to more universalist uh, discourse. Okay, thank you. Aida, do you want to make a last uh, comment or? 
Um, yes, I just wanted to say something about the issue of uh, positive emotions and how yeah, they have to deal with the negative and aggressive ones that usually are uh, more powerful. Um, I think the Balkans can be like a laboratory to uh, study, analyze and think about this because of this so long dominance since war and post-war of negative and fearful uh, emotional politics. So what I also experience is uh, this willingness to also by the people like to 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 be mobilized by positive emotions, by something that, OK, we are fighting, but not only against, but for for the preservation of our rivers, for the preservation of our identity and relationship with nature, which, um, yes, there there can be this uh, this example due to this history of uh, very negative and aggressive uh, political narratives and uh, yes, emotional narratives. This is it. And I want to thank you again for uh, this uh, beautiful discussion. I'm so happy that I had the possibility to join you at least online. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you, everyone. <laughs>